But Melvin, tell me what your life is like now um, in terms of, uh, you know, now that the book is out. And part of you has got to be glad that, that it's, it's lending support to you, to your story you've told all these years. Part of you has got to be tired of telling the same stuff over again. Well, at least now somebody's come out that actually believes it, and, and uh, we're getting a lot of supporting evidence to show that I wasn't lying about picking up Hughes, and it does make me feel a lot better for what it's worth. Um, I, I just, uh, for almost 20 years, I was in, in a, a state of, uh, I don't even know how to explain it, where I was almost felt like I was just a living zombie, you know, because I, I didn't really want to talk to anybody. I didn't, I kind of would want to spend a lot of time by myself, not even socialize with people. And, and it's kind of starting to turn around. And even, well, in the 80s, late 70s, I used to like to go out and entertain and sing. And, and, uh, and for almost 20 years, I just stopped everything, it seemed like. I mean, I, I would try to earn a living the best I could, but, but the, uh, uh, it, was, it was hard. Hard because why? Because people, I, well, you, uh, people because, didn't believe you. And yeah, made because fun of you? they did. You know, I I'd hear the snickers and the or the you know the people talking and and everything and and uh, it 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 bothered me and uh, therefore I didn't you know make a whole lot of friends and and just kind of withdrew from. Uh, before Hughes died, I was kind of investing in real estate and stuff like that, and we were doing fairly good and I think that by now I'd have been totally retired you know if Hughes hadn't have remembered me but then you know because of the situation that you know we had to sell just about everything we owned it and, and it just it, it I, I like lost my ambition and everything because of it. Tell me about this uh, the, uh, uh, Gary Magnuson the FBI guy how is it that he came to uh, contact you? How well, that happen? I, uh, Gary Magnus, I got a job working for Asset Recovery, um, which uh, liquidates bankruptcies, you know, when stores go out of business and stuff. And I was working with his brother, Dean, and, uh, and I'd worked off and on with him, you know, doing several different jobs over the years. And uh, he'd told me that his brother was in the FBI. And, and then um, just a few years ago, uh, his brother retired from the FBI, and he, and I guess it was uh, Dean Magnuson that got him, and you know his brother. He said you ought to go talk to Melvin, you know, because <laughs> and so so Dean uh, uh, put him in contact with me, and so Gary came up and and seen me, and first time I talked to Gary and or met him, uh, he just you know basically asked me about what happened and everything, and and. From talking to him, I could see that he, you know he didn't he didn't believe me at all. Gary didn't, and uh, but I told him you know my involvement, what had happened as far as I knew, and I told him I'm not trying to to persuade you one way or the other. I said this is what happened, this is what I went through. Go check it out yourself. You know just you know find out for yourself. You and know? he decided and, and to do so, it just for so he he decided to do it and and do a little checking and and. Uh, and I guess from you know, listening to him, you know, the, things started um, checking out and, and one thing led to another. And he said, wait a minute, you know, this, this is like a big puzzle. And he started putting it back together and saying, man, and he, I think, totally changed his mind. Was there one yeah. thing that happened that he found when he called you on the phone and said, uh, hey, well, Melvin, I, I think I, I finally believe you. What? Well, one of the things he found, or even before he found uh, Daryl, was uh, the uh, records of the mining claims and the locations uh, where they were, and, and you know that they were recorded. There was recorded evidence, and uh, the exact road that I picked up Hughes on, uh, Hughes at that particular time had an option on the mining claims that was on that road, uh, and. Uh, he exercised that option. It was only about, uh, well, 20 days or so before his option run out 
that, that he had on the mining claims that was there. And, and uh, he was, uh, Hughes was trying to corner the gold and silver market and, and he ended up buying hundreds of mining claims, but those were the, some of the first ones that, that he uh, got in, uh, it, well, he had the option on them in late 1967, early 68. And, it, and it's recorded, you know, the, the dates and the locations and everything. And, and so he, and then, uh, then of course, when uh, Bob Darrow, he got a hold of uh, Johnny Meyer and, and then Bob Darrow called. And, and I actually put, uh, I listened to Bob Darrow called me and he called me off of that one article you have uh, and uh, told me his story. And uh, of course, Gary was already started on the book and I said, uh, I told Bob, I said, there's uh, somebody else I'd like you to talk to. <laughs> I said, please give him a call, you know, and tell him, tell him what, uh, you know, what you know about it. And so he did. And, and so. Were you, uh, were you and Bonnie at all worried about the possibility of a book opening this thing up all over again? Were you, was there a point at which you said, I, you know, I just as soon let it go. Well, I knew Gary, you know, he wanted to do something. And, and so, uh, it didn't take him too long to get back with me, and I knew that he was had found some things that was in my favor, and and like the you know because he started checking out the location and the and the records and the, and the mining claims and and then I think pretty early on he got a hold of Johnny Meyer, and uh, and Johnny Meyer uh, told him some stuff and and so he said you know maybe there is something to this, and so he. Uh, I think he got more and more intrigued as the time went on, but uh, I think uh, it wasn't too long after he talked to me that you know that he he did a few calls and did a few checks that that uh, he found out that hey you know there was something to it. So you were not worried that this is going to open it all up and cause problems for you and your wife? No, I uh, I, I really didn't worry about it uh, causing problems because everything that I, my involvement in is all out in the open and everybody knows what I've done. <laughs> and, and so I figure, well, what the heck, you know, you're going to hurt me any worse than it already has. So, uh, you know, I told him to go for it, you know, whatever you're, you know, because I don't have anything to hide, you know, and, and even what I, you know, I picked Hughes up and stuff. The only thing that I regret is when all this first happened, is uh, Levain Forsythe bringing that will to me and not knowing who he was or where he was from or why he left it with me, it scared the living daylights out of me and I just didn't know how to handle it. And so my curiosity over the will itself and, and uh, when I steamed it open and, and read it and found out what, what it was, was I didn't even know what to do with it, other than it was like a you know picking up a hot potato. I didn't want to hold it <laughs> any longer than I absolutely had to, and so since it was addressed to the president of the Mormon Church, I decided well that's where I should take it, and so when I took it down there and tried to see the president of the church, and they wouldn't let me to see him. They told me I had to make appointments and and go through a lot of rigmarole. I, 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 like I said, I didn't want to, to hold it any longer than I had to. So I, uh, since I couldn't get in to see him, I just uh, put in another envelope and left it on a, on a desk there so that, you know, that it would get to him, addressed it to the then current president of the church. But then when the news media got a hold of it, like the next day or a couple of days later, and uh, I was listening to the news, and I heard it on the news before anybody ever got a hold of me. And they said a mysterious woman had delivered this will to the Mormon church. And I thought, well, if they think a mysterious woman delivered this will to the church, I'm just going to let them believe that. Because at that point in time, I didn't know if it was real or if it was a fake myself. And so I just thought, well, if they think a mysterious woman delivered it, and if it's a fake, you know, I don't want anything part of it, so, so I'm just going to let them believe that. And that caught me in a lie, you know, and, and I regret that part. But um, so then, uh, you know, after, you know, they started checking everything out, 
then I had to tell them, you know, exactly what happened and how it happened, and and uh, and that's what really you know hurt me, and I had to live with that. And uh, that's one of the biggest lessons of life, you know. If you tell the truth, then you don't have to worry about it. I mean, you know, let it run its course as long as you're telling the truth. Uh, you know, you don't have to remember what you said uh, because the truth is always the truth. You became and, an overnight celebrity, right? International <laughs> celebrity. Yeah. It, it was for a short period of time, and then everybody started calling me a, a liar and a con and a forger and, you know, whatever else they could come up with. Well, let's talk life. about the short period of time first, what that was like. That must have been a heck of a ride, wasn't it? It actually, to me, it was a little nerve-wracking and, and, and scary. You know, because, you know, people, right from the get-go, people start coming out of the woodwork and, and you know, uh, just because of, of the, the news, people thought automatically I had all this money and, and uh, you know, it, it got to be a little scary because people, even though a lot of people, you know, just uh, said congratulations and all that, there was a lot of people wanting me to contribute to whatever cause they had going. And then, then there was other people that started coming out of the woodwork claiming they were with me and that I should share it with them. And a lot of people was thinking that I already automatically had all the money and started coming around demanding that I give them money. And, and uh, you know, and, and as a consequence, I, I got even got, you know, threatened, you know, got my life threatened, got, you know, just, you know, threatened that, you know, they were going to blow up my house or car, you know, if I didn't give them money and, and had people pull knives on me and guns on me and, and everything, you know, just claiming they were with me or they wanted part of the money or, you know, for whatever reason. And, and it, uh, it got a little spooky for a while. What was the other, was there a good part of that? I mean, you know, you're doing TV appearances well, and radio appearances. And I was, and, and then I, uh, you know, they came to me wanting to make movies and, and things. And uh, so, but it turned around so quickly. Even even the movie, uh, the the movie Melvin and Howard that we signed a contract for it. Uh, the handwriting experts right at first uh, was all saying that it was legitimate that it was Howard Hughes' handwriting. Then all of a sudden they started turning around and saying no, it wasn't. Uh, I know part of the reason behind that now, but. Uh, Right when we were signing the movie contract, and then you know, at first uh, the Henry experts and everybody was saying it was legitimate, and then they started saying that it was a forgery. Uh, some of the same handwriting experts, you know, it, and uh, I thought, you know, what is going on here? And so, what they originally wanted to offer me to make the uh, movie, they cut that way down. Uh, you know, because uh, some, you know they started getting some negative uh, publicity, and uh, I understand now about some of the handwriting experts, where the uh, president of the American Handwriting Association, a guy by the name of Harris, uh, some of the handwriting experts that originally said that it was authentic, when it came to trying to get them to testify in court, they wouldn't do it because they were threatened by someone that if they testified that it was uh, legitimate that they'd be blackballed from the American Handwriting Act, uh, Association. Now where those threats come from I don't know but it uh, you know a lot of things like that started happening and and it it, it made me want start wondering you know. Do you own a copy of the movie? Mm -hmm. Do you watch it? Do you ever watch it? Oh, and not too often anymore. Every once in a while it's on TV, and if I happen upon it, I'll, I'll, I think in December they showed it on, on TV about three or four different times. What do you think about it? I think that if, if they'd have uh, made it more realistic, I mean exactly what happened, it probably would have been a better movie than what it was. It was it's a good movie. It's a good movie. But uh, I think that... Uh, they even filmed more that they cut out, you know, of, of the movie because they, it was too long. <laughs> what about the portrayal of Paul Lamont of you? Paul I mean, Lamont, he, 
he did a, a, a fair job. I uh, personally, I wanted to play myself, and and I drove him nuts because <laughs> I, yeah, at first, you know. I told them, well, you know, I don't think anybody can play me better than myself, <laughs> and 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 they I, they got fed up with me. They they didn't even hang up on me because I said, oh, just just let me try, you know. <laughs> I mean, you know, but uh, but yeah. I mean, you, I, he seemed really likable. You seemed like a likable character in that movie, and I know maybe yeah. you know it showed your life with a warts and all and everything. But I, I, just but, as a movie fan, I just thought you came across pretty well. The, the thing about that is. Um, <laughs> bless her heart, my ex-wife and stuff, they, they made it look like I was really a loser. I mean, you know, getting my cars repossessed all the time and, and boats repossessed and, you know, and, and they, they, they kind of exaggerated a little bit. Milk man of the month? Well, yeah, I, I did that. I mean, I was very good at whatever, you know, like uh, salesman and I did win contests at the dairy and, and think, you know, for getting new customers, but, uh, uh, in fact, I want, that's where I got my first color TV because I wanted from the, you know, well, the that's dairy. True. That part's that's true. Yeah, that part's true. And, and, uh, but how they put things together, like my ex-wife going on a TV show and buying a house and then me going out and buying a Cadillac and a boat and, and all that. I had you know the Cadillac and the boat and, and, and we did buy a house based on my ex-wife's winnings on Let's Make a Deal. But they changed it all around. Uh, I bought a boat here in Utah, the only boat I've ever owned, and it wasn't didn't have anything to do with the movie. In fact, it was when my wife and I were were divorced. We weren't even married. I wasn't even in California, um, and, but I did have a boat <laughs> for a while, and I, it never got repossessed. We ended up selling it after Bonnie and I got married and moved back to Utah. <laughs> but uh, and. Uh, one of the Cadillacs that I got, um, yeah, I, uh, I had an Eldorado convertible then, but my wife and I, Linda, uh, wasn't even together at the time. But uh, she, we kind of got back together, and one of her good buddies, friends, barroom buddies, wanted to buy the car because I decided I wanted to sell it. And so he wanted to take it for a test drive, and you know he said he was going to buy it. I never seen the car again. He just like stole it, gone. And uh, and so I told the finance company to you know to find it because I had no clue where it went. I didn't even know where this guy lived. And then uh, another car repossessed is because uh, well right there when I picked up Hughes, the same car that I picked Hughes up in. Uh, got repossessed because I did on that particular trip. I went to California because my wife had run off some other guy. I went down there in California, picked her up. We went back to Nevada because I was living in Gabs. But a few months later, she took that car and ran off with another guy from Hawthorne and uh, ended up in Las Vegas, but with the same car that uh, she'd, uh, you know, that I'd picked Hughes up in. It was a 1966 Chevrolet Caprice. And uh, my feeling, when she took off, I wasn't going to pay for a car for her and some other guy to run around in. So I just stopped paying on it. And um, it was kind of funny because it was in 1968. Uh, I went to Vegas. I would filed for divorce. And I went to Vegas looking for Linda because I knew she'd uh, moved there. And I found out where she was working. You need her to sign papers and stuff? Yeah. yeah. And so I went to Las Vegas, but I found the car before I found her. Well, I found you know where she was working in the California Club in Vegas, but uh, I found the car parked. I think it was called the Rancho Market or something. I can't remember for sure. But I, I seen I was driving down the road because I we had two cars and I seen my car. It was very easily recognizable because my wife had tried to run over me before and the, the driver's door of the car was caved in and stuff. And, and, uh, and so you could tell, and so I- And did she hit you with the car? She the tried car, to run over The car that I was driving at that time looking for her was her, actually her car, but we left it in California when I picked her up and went back to Nevada. But before I went to Nevada, she tried to run me down. 
<laughs> and, and then I jumped out of the way, and so she crashed into the side of the car. <laughs> so, <laughs> but anyway, we, we had some good fights. But uh, anyway, uh, when I found the car, uh, it was interesting to me that there was a note in that car, the, the, the 66 Caprice, and I can't remember who it was from or if it was even signed, but it, I was living in Gabs, and this was in Las Vegas, and there was a note in the car uh, re asking if I'd moved to Las Vegas, which I hadn't, and then it was asking me to go to some bank in, in uh, Las Vegas and ask for somebody that I didn't, didn't even know, and I, and I, you know, I didn't know what it was all about, so I just, I think I just threw the note away, oh or the gosh. letter. So it was a, a note, somebody had found the car, slipped it into the yep. car, and was asking you to come see him. Yeah, well, it was telling, asking me if I'd moved to Vegas and, and asking me to go to some bank there in Las Vegas. That's pretty strange. And, and uh, yeah, I thought it was kind of strange, but see, when I was down there, I, I was there to have Linda served with divorce papers, and it was on a weekend, and and I didn't even have a bank account, so I thought, I don't know what this is all about. So I didn't, I didn't follow up on it. You weren't really but, thinking on the on the will and all that no, stuff at the no. time. No, yeah. I don't even know if it was associated, but it could have been because it was right in that same time frame. I think it was like in April of, or, or maybe May of '68, and uh, and uh, but whoever it was knew my car or knew that car. But, I, I want to ask you about uh, the obvious question about the night picking him up. You were on your way to? I was on my way to California. To find your wife. Yeah, because, <laughs> see, I was living in California, and uh, she ran off with a guy, and, and we had, you know, a pretty good little fight and stuff, and uh, and that's when she kind of crashed in the side of my car a little bit, and, and so I, I got mad and quit my job and moved back up to Nevada because that's where I was raised, and uh, um, I was, had moved up to Gabs. Uh, I've got a couple of brothers that live there, and they still live there in Gabs. And so I moved up there and got a job, but I was still crazy. I wanted to run back and forth and find her, and, and uh, I found out that the guy she'd run off with, they'd had a fight, and so she was back at her mother's place in Cypress, California. So this is one of the things they screwed up in the movie. Uh, on the 27th of December of 67, I had a motorcycle and I was there in Gabs and I was trying some of the evil Knievel stuff, <laughs> seeing how far I could jump it. Well, it, 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 it didn't work too good. Uh, and I, uh, I kind of crashed and burned. <laughs> and and uh, my whole face, they took me to, the Hoth, uh, to Hawthorne uh, because it knocked me out and, and my whole face was a big scab. I mean, it was just horribly, you know, ripped up. I'm surprised I don't have scars all over my face. But uh, I only spent a day or so in the, in the hospital there, the, like the 27th of December of 67. And so when I got out of uh, the hospital, uh, I went back up to BASIC, the, the mine that I was working at, and asked them when I could come back to work, and they told me to take a couple of weeks off, you know, so my face and stuff would heal up, you know, so they wouldn't get infected. And so I thought, well, if I, you know, I'll have a week or two off, I'll go back to California and see if I can hook back up with my ex-wife, Linda. Good thinking. <laughs> yeah, Good thinking, yeah, Albert. nutcase, yeah. <laughs> and so, so I, uh, I left uh, on the 29th of December of 67, and, uh, I went over to, to um, Tonopah and I stayed there for, I don't know how long I was there, but I, I sometimes used to like to gamble a little bit. And so I went there to the Mizpah and stayed in there for a little while. And then after I left, it was, I don't even know what time it was, I started heading, because I was going down through Vegas and then on down to Cypress, California. And uh, just past the Cottontail Ranch there a few miles, I decided I'd you know, pull off and relieve myself, and and I pulled off onto a little dirt road, and that's where I found Hughes. And uh, I wanted to, you know, at first I thought he was dead because he was just laying in this little dirt road in one of the ruts of the road. And so, but then, uh, you know, I 
it didn't take very long. I seen him start to move, and I said, well, whoever it is, at least they're not dead. They're in pretty bad shape, but they're not dead. And so I got out and, and helped him up and, and brought him over, put him in the car, and asked if I could take him to a hospital or a doctor and or, or ask him if I could take him to the police. And, and he didn't want nothing to do with hospitals or doctors or police or anything. He just wanted to go to Vegas. And I said, well, OK, I'm going da down there or through there anyway, so I'll take you to Vegas. What kind of shape was he in? He was. Uh, pretty bad. At first he uh, he was just trembling violently. He was just shaking all over and, and he had blood on him too. He had blood, I thought it was coming out of his ear. It was on the side of his face and you know on his shirt and, and uh, I thought God you know I, I, I thought somebody had you know beat him up and just dumped him there I, but I don't know. He wouldn't tell me you know uh, what he was doing there or how he got there so I just took him to Vegas. And But on the way to Vegas which really got me that's when he told me who he was is, is I was, he asked me, you know, questions, you know, who I was and what I was doing and, and uh, I told him a little bit about uh, I'd been in the Air Force and I'd got out of the Air Force and I'd tried to get a job working at Hughes Aircraft in Fullerton, California. And he said, well, I know, you know, I, he, he was familiar with that <laughs> because he owned it, he said. And I thought, you know, this guy's nuts. And, and then he said that if I wanted a job, that he could arrange it. And I thought, boy, he really is, because <laughs> I thought he was a bum or, you know, an old wino. So I, you know, I, oh, well. Because <laughs> he's dressed poorly, he's oh, dirty. Oh, yeah, yeah, he's, he, he was pretty messed up. And I said, oh, well, you know, he's... So, at what point does he come out and say, "Hey, by the way, I'm Howard Hughes"? Oh, th well, that's when he's. That's when he said, he, you know, when he. I start talking about trying to get a job at Hughes Aircraft. He said he was familiar with it. He he knew about it because he owned it. He was Howard Hughes, and I thought, yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> at that time, you know, I was 23 years old, and 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 uh, you know, I in looking at him, putting it in prescription. Perspective. He was just the same age as I am now. You know, he was 61, I think, at that time. But he looked older, and and he he, he was just he was just a, he was, he looked like a mess, and so that's why I thought he was just a transient or you know a bum, and so I took him to Vegas and, and took him uh, where I took him to the Sands Hotel. He, that's where he wanted to go. And uh, I know one thing that kind of puzzled me when I first you know asked him where he wanted me to drop him off at. And he told me the sands. Well, when I pulled into the sands right off the strip, I think it's gone now. Yeah. But, but uh, he, it was like he panicked. He said, "No, take me around back. You know, you want me to take him to the back, uh, around uh, backside." So I said, "Okay, whatever." So I took him back there and just you know dropped him off. And then he uh, and then he asked me if I had any money. And I thought he was you know asking for money because he wanted to make a phone call or buy another jug or whatever <laughs> and so I reached in my pocket and gave him some change and and uh, he got out of the car and that was it when he got uh, away from the car then I just drove off and and uh, went on to California okay we'll and then here. when I got to when I got to California <laughs> went to my you know ex in-laws house and my wife of course answered the door and she says oh god you look terrible you know because my face was a big scab <laughs> you know and and then it was that same day uh well it was my wife's uh, stepfather uh this guy named wayne sisk i started talking to him and, and uh, say hey guess who i picked up on the way down here and, and i told him about it and and he said oh Nobody's seen him for 15 years. Why didn't you take a picture of him? You know, and you know, they, and I, I said, well, you know, hell, if, even if I'd had a camera, I probably wouldn't have taken a picture of him. So. Now, years later, did anybody ask him to, to verify that you had told him that story? They did, and I don't know who it was, but when Hughes died in '76, Wayne Sisk also died in '76 a few months later, but. When they first contacted me, and I think it was the FBI, I'm not sure who there was, but I was, uh, I remember one day I was down at uh, my parents' house, it was just a few days after it all came out, and they asked me, well, did you ever tell anybody about this? And I, you know, there were several people I told, and, and I told them uh, about Wayne Sisk. And they said, where's Wayne Sisk? And I said, I don't really know. The last I heard, he was in a hospital somewhere in Georgia. 
and you know I didn't know where and I didn't even know what his condition was but you know his his son or somebody had told me that he was in the hospital you think they found and him? and yeah oh yeah because Wayne called me about two hours later he says what is going on he said they'd already been there they'd located him and, and found him and talked to him and, and and he called me and says what's what's happening what's going on <laughs> so somewhere there's a file that that confirms that oh yeah and I think it was the FBI because it, it couldn't have been over two hours from the time I told these guys, and I think they were FBI, I'm not positive who they were, maybe they were investigators for Sumer or something, yeah. but they'd located him and they were at that hospital questioning him. So it had to be somebody that had, you know, people all over the country. Let's talk about the will. Uh, you're, you're working at a gas station uh -huh. uh, right down the road. Ouch. And, uh, and in somebody comes one day. Oh. Well, the, we you, we found out who it was, or at least uh, Levain Forsythe uh, said that, you know, after a while came forward and said that he was the one that delivered it. And they even had me go to Alaska to identify him. And, and uh, he just came in uh, one day, I, was, I think it was about two weeks after Hughes died, and just started asking me a lot of questions about, uh, you know, what I thought of Hughes dying, you know. And, to me, I didn't care. I mean, everybody's got to go. I, I cared, but I care about people. But uh, you know, I I didn't know what uh, you know why he was asking me that, and he and he asked me questions if I'd ever met him, and and uh, uh, you know, and I thought you know this is kind of strange. You know, why is he asking me all this stuff? And um, he uh, he did say, wouldn't it be great if somebody like you was left in his will? And I thought, well, that ain't going to happen. <laughs> at least at that particular point in time and and then then uh, he he just followed me around and you know just talked to me and, and uh, finally you know, another customer came in and I said excuse me and I went out to help the other customer and uh, when I came back he was gone and I said well what whoever he was I yeah I, I don't know but he and, left something behind but See, when he came in, I was going to Weber State College at the time. I was going to night school and stuff up there. And when he came in, I was not in the station part. I had a kind of a little store in there, but I, there was a back bar there that I had my books and stuff. And I was reading, you know, some of my school books and stuff. And, and that's where I was when he, he first, you know, came in. I didn't even really hear him come in, but he came back there and, and, uh, and so that's where he started talking to me at. And so after he'd left, you know, and I didn't know who he was or where he went, and, and the other customers left, I went back and I was gonna, you know, do a little more studying and write all my school books was that envelope with the will in it. And I thought, what the, you know, I, I didn't even see him leave it there, but it, it had to be in him. He was the only one that even came in the station. And, um, and I was there by myself and I thought, you know, what the heck is this, you know? And so I, uh, I mean, right away, you know, reading the envelope where it says uh, on it, like, Dear Mr. McKay, please see that this is delivered to the Clark County Courthouse after my death, Howard R. Hughes. I think that's what it says on the will. And I thought, what is going on? You know, this is, and, and, and it, you know, it piqued my curiosity, like it probably would to almost anybody. And so I said, I'm going to see what this is all about. And so I, you steamed it open. I steamed it open, and, and people say, well, how'd you know how to do that? Well, see, you know, I had an ex-wife that uh, every once in a while I'd find a letter that she'd wrote or somebody wrote her from her boyfriends because she ran off about a dozen different times with different guys, and, and every once in a while I'd steam her <laughs> letters open. <laughs> and that's why we used to have some pretty good fights, you know, because <laughs> she would, uh, you know, uh, I'd know what she was up to. And, uh, but... Uh, so I steamed it open and read it. In fact, I read it about a dozen times. I, I couldn't hardly believe it. You know, I was, you know it, was, it, was, it was just seems crazy, you know? And I thought, man, is somebody trying to pull a joke on me or is this real or, you know, what should I do? Uh, and, and it really confused me, it scared me, you know? And, and so I decided that I was gonna just take it down to the church myself. And, and see if I could talk to the president and tell him, you know, what what happened. And I get down to the church, and they say, well, no, you can't see the president. He's he's involved, and you got to bring your bishop, and you got to make appointments. And you, they just started, you know, telling me all kinds of things. So I said, well, I 
I can't see the president of the church. You know, I can't, you know, crash his door down and say, you know, demand it. So, you know, I said, well, I'll just leave it and hopefully he'll get it. You know, I put it in another envelope and addressed it to him. And, and somewhere along the line, and I don't know if it was Levain Foresight or who it was, had told me about a Hughes will uh, somewhere being found at one of the church president's house, in his house or around it. So I actually wrote a little note when I put it in there that, you know, this was found by, I think it was Joseph Smith's house, in his house or around it or, you know, I, I couldn't remember what they'd told me or what I'd heard. So I just said, you know, that was it. I left it. And then that, like I said, then they, the news media comes out that this mysterious woman had delivered it. and. When we got into court, they even asked me if I ever dressed in drag. You know? so, <laughs> so I said, well, no, I never had. So. That, the fact that you opened it and then weren't truthful about it, that caused you all kinds of problems. Oh, it, it did. I mean, that that made everybody think you were a liar yeah, to begin with. Yeah, it, it did. It, you know, everybody thought, oh, yeah, yeah, he's a forger and he's a con man and all that. But, but one of the things that... Actually, the FBI kind of confirmed, you know, they, they wanted to check everything out, of course. And I told them, I said, look, I steamed it open and I read it and I re-glued it. But when I did that, I couldn't, I couldn't get it to seal. So I uh, got some glue, uh, I, I think I scraped it off of a different type of envelope and put on there so that I could seal the envelope back up because I didn't want, you know, really, since it wasn't addressed to me and I was taking it to the church, I didn't want nobody to even know that I'd opened it. And, uh, but the FBI confirmed that, you know, because they sent it to the crime lab to see if it had been steamed open and re-glued. And so one of the FBI reports comes back and says, yes, it had been steamed open and, and re-glued using a foreign glue, you know, glue not, not uh, uh, found on that particular envelope. And, and I told him, I says, you know, if I'd have wrote that damn thing, what logical reason would I have to, to steam it open? Yeah. You know, it, it, it's nuts, you know. And, and I told Gary Magnus in that. I said, you know, this is what I did. This is how I handled it. This is where I left it. And, and uh, you know, and so he started checking it out. And said, well, okay. <laughs> the so, idea that you could, you forged it or you could have forged it. Could you have forged something like that? Could you have written a will like that? Did you know the facts that were included in there? And well, you know, they, uh, I think that, that it would have taken somebody really familiar with, you know, Hughes' operation to, to, to write that. And, uh, of course, they accused me of writing it. And one of the things that they accused me of doing is, is going to the library and getting the book Hoax and using that as a model to, to forge it and everything. Well, it wasn't too long after it came out and was delivered, you know, a week or two, there's another thing with the news media. I had no clue even where to even look for any type of samples of Hughes' handwriting. That would have been the first thing. And, uh, and I see on TV that they're talking about the book Hoax in a, a Life magazine. And uh, so I had copies of the will that the news media had brought me. And, and I said, well, I want to check this out myself and see, see if it even resembles his writing or anything. And so I went around, I, in fact, I went to the, um, the library in, in Ogden, the, the county library, and I couldn't find nothing in there. So I went up to the college library uh, at Weber State College where I was going, and, uh, and there was news media following me around and everything, even up there, and that, I dropped out of college because of, because of it. But I went up there and I did find the book hoax but I couldn't, you know, this was a week or two, maybe three weeks. I don't know how long it was after I delivered the will, but I did find the book hoax up there, but I couldn't find nothing in it. I couldn't, no, find, any, I couldn't find any handwriting samples or, or anything. So when I get into court, they accuse me of checking the book out and, and, and uh, uh, removing, they said there was some in there, in the book hoax. But when I went and looked at it, I couldn't find anything. In the, in the book hoax up at the library. So they tried and, to make it look like you'd got the book before yeah, you forged and, the and will. And the, uh, the thing is, the, uh, speaking of the book hoax, to this day I have never read that book. Never read it. Never had an interest in reading it. I know what it's about, you know, but that... Uh, <laughs> can you remember his name? Gary something, wasn't it? Uh, Gary... I'm trying to remember. Yeah, I know who you mean. I don't know, but, but anyway, you're supposed to have some 
autobiography of Hughes, yeah. but, but I, I never read it there. I never checked it out of the library. I've still never read the, the book, Hoax. The one time I seen it, I seen it for, for about two minutes there at the college library, thumbed through it, couldn't find any, you know, any samples of his handwriting, you know, to compare it with the, you know, the writing on the will. And so uh, I, I've never, uh, I've never read it to this day. Never read that book, never. One other question in this vein, then the trial, the trial takes place. It's, it's uh, in, in Las Vegas. Were you down there for the whole thing? No, just, just when they called me. I was down there for a week or two, but. You were the star witness though. Yeah. What was I, that like? That must've been brutal. Well, actually, I was there uh, on different occasions. They had like a pre-trial first, and uh, and then you know before the trial, the the worst thing that happened there, I think, uh, that was pretty brutal, was when the judge called me a liar. The judge called you a liar. The judge called me a liar and said that he was going to send me to prison and everything, you know, uh, because I, I guess he he thought maybe the will was forged too, and and so he. He said that if you know if he found that I was lying in his court, that he was going to make his duty to make sure that I went to the Nevada State Penitentiary, and uh, so I don't know. Well, and by then, the time the trial is over, even though it went the other way, there was no, the judge didn't come back and say, "Hey, I need to send you, know, you to jail." You know, he um, <laughs> a person might you know check with the attorneys and stuff, but I found that off the kind of off the record and stuff that the judge had told the attorneys and stuff that he was going to make a public apology to me, you know, after they started finding some of the evidence, you know, that, you know, showing that I wasn't lying. Uh, but he never did. I saw one of the books by Roden, that attorney. Harold Roden. Yeah. yeah. At, at the end of that book, he says that the judge, after he died, there was a statement where he made that he said he wants to see two people in heaven. Oh, his mother and, and Howard and Hughes. And Howard Hughes, because he had a question he'd like to ask him. I know yeah. what the question would be. Yeah, yeah. but, uh, oh, that was Keith Hayes. Yeah. But, you know, I, at that time, you know, when Keith Hayes, you know, called me a liar, I could understand what he was trying to do, and, and I could understand his position. Trying to scare you into coming yeah. clean if yeah. you were. Yeah, yeah. So the the one that uh, that really worse than the, the judge, though, I mean, calling me a liar and, and never, never actually uh, making a public apology, which according to my attorneys, you know, he said he was going to, but he never did, uh, not to me anyway, uh, was the uh, Nevada Attorney General, that Robert List. I had several people just recently tell me, you know, because Robert List was trying everything within his power to have me thrown in prison. He was the one behind, you know, having everything checked out with the FBI and the crime labs and, and all that. And, uh, 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 and I didn't really think that it was the Attorney General's uh, uh, duty or place that, that he should be after me you know, when they're going through litigation. So, so uh, a few of my friends around Nevada, they told me, they said, well, you know, why don't you look into the political motivation of Robert List and see why he would be doing that? So I did. I started doing my own investigation on Robert List and, you know, find uh, things that uh, right during the trial where the Summa Corporation had, had uh, donated him uh, $25,000 and they'd made other contributions for the Robert List to, to become governor and, and um, you know, and then, then, you know, different expenditures of Robert List, you know, why would he be uh, writing it off as a political expenditure entertaining the ex-governor of Texas and his staff and, oh. and you know, different things like this. And, yeah, and it makes me wonder about, you know, his, his political motivation. And of course, he got elected governor right after this, you know. Thanks to people like Steve Wynn, uh, you know, who owns a lot of stuff around Vegas and ta Lake Tahoe, and uh, but it it it, it kind of puzzles me about uh, like during the trial, why Suma would be giving Robert List, uh, you know, this, they call them political contributions, I call them bribes, you know, I call them what they are, you know. <laughs> 
it's uh, the verdict comes back it's 8-0 I, you know um there are allegations that have been raised and are still unanswered even now about uh, jury tampering I'll, I'll ask it this way do you think if that if that uh, court case had been heard in any other city other than las vegas that the the decision would have been different i think that the decision would have been different but if they'd have known what they know now, what Gary and some of them have dug up, if the jury had have even known that, I think there would have been a completely different verdict. You know, if they'd have known that, that the very spot and the date and, and time period and everything where I picked him up, you know, that Hughes actually had a, a legitimate reason to be there. Meaning if they had known that you weren't lying about finding him, they might have been more sympathetic to considering oh, yeah. the, the will oh, yeah. was real. And, uh, and I, that was the number one reason why they said that it was a forgery and they threw it out of court, is because they convinced the jury that he never left the desert inn. And he did leave it. He left it on a number of occasions, and I know it. Well, I knew it all the time, but, but now, you know, the FBI knows it and a lot of other people know it. That, that, uh, that he, he uh, in fact, I even talked to... Uh, well, it's, uh, it would be considered hearsay, but one of the brother-in-laws of Howard Eckersley, it, it's too bad Howard Eckersley passed away, but his brother-in-law told me, he said that Howard once told him, he said, hey, he said, uh, before, before his brother-in-law Howard Eckersley died, he said, he said he'd told him, he said, uh, don't believe all those uh, stories you hear about Hughes being such a big recluse because he was out and about on several occasions. You know, and I believed it. <laughs> so, right. yeah, he's, you know, that's, that's true. <laughs> you know, they, they, they assume a corporation. Some of them, they, they want to, you know, keep it quiet. They, you know, and, 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 of course, he was pretty secretive. He didn't want everybody to know that, you know, what he was up to all the time. You, uh, but, I mean, uh, you ever think about what your life would be like if you had all that money? <laughs> you had $150 million? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> Right, right, right from, I, I'd thought about it, but uh, even right from the beginning, I, I thought, shh, I ain't never going to see anything from this, you know. Even if I did, they'd keep it tied up in court for so long that it wouldn't even matter. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, it's like I didn't go out and spend the money. Yeah. <laughs> I, the, the only thing that, that, that kind of excited me more than, than the, then the, uh, that was when they made the, the movie, and uh, I thought I'd probably get more money from the movie than I would ever see from the, any will. But then I, it was almost a joke, even the movie, you know, the, what I got out of, you know, the movie about me. Because I didn't, most of that went to the attorneys. Well, maybe this will be a new chapter and they'll have to do another one. Yeah, <laughs> that's the... It may be. I, I don't know. One with a happier ending. Maybe. Uh, the guy could only hope, I guess. <laughs>